year in our school to talk about raising boys and educating boys is a dream come true for me for a very, very long time for two reasons. One, because understanding the emotions and physical needs of boys can be difficult to understand. Second, I don't think I could have found anyone better to come and talk to us on the topic that our guest is here to speak about tonight. Name a radio show or TV show, NPR, 2020, 60 Minutes, The Oprah Show, Good Morning Show. He's been there talking about boys. Name a city, a country, a continent, Asia, Africa, South America, Europe. He's been there talking about boys. I could go on and on, and I'm going to stop there, because we have so much to learn from our speaker tonight. It is my proud honor to introduce you to Dr. Michael Thompson. Yeah, all right. Sam, what am I doing? We good? Can you, people can hear me? Yes? All right, I'm completely wired up, both for the video and, but I want to be heard. So if in the back, if you're having difficulty, oh, there it is. We are good to go. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to be here. Jenny called me and asked if I would do this. She was surprised when I said yes, she shouldn't have been. Because uh, I've known about Jenny for 35 years because her mother, a school leader in Virginia, uh, hired me a lot when I was a very young school consultant and knew nothing. I had really no experience. And her mother, who had an in immense amount of experience in school leadership, used me as a consultant and actually taught me uh, far more than I think I contributed to her. So I've always um, had a, a debt uh, to her mom and got to know her dad very well. But what Jenny doesn't realize is how much her mom talked to me about her. <laughs> so um, to have Jenny call was kind of it knits my life together in, in a very nice way. And I'm, I'm delighted to be here and delighted to see um, what a terrific audience uh, uh, Jenny's uh, efforts of beating the drum have brought out. And my wish is to be helpful um, and practical. I'm kind of assuming, but let's get a show of hands. How many of you are parents or grandparents of boys? Yes, good, <laughs> you've come to the right place. How many of you, little guys birth to five years old? Five to 10 years old? 10 to 15? 15 to 20? What are you still hoping for? <laughs> the dire kind of cast. So somebody um, give me, uh, somebody with a little guy, a birth to five years old, if I could address the concern you have, the worry you have, what, what would it be? Come on, come on, look, play with me. You've come to uh, interact with a psychologist you may not have thought about. I have a talk to give, but I'd like to know. If I could address any concern you have about a younger than five year old boy, what, what would it be? Please, your name. Danielle, we're going to get you the mic. <laughs> All right. I won't put you too terribly on the spot. You're speeding. Yes. So my son is three, and I would say that the toughest thing would be the power struggles. Yes. With that age group. Right. <laughs> He's a little barbarian. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Human aggression peaks between two and a half and three. Utterly remorseless unapologetic human aggression peaks. And they're feeling that little power 
and, and everything's just, thank goodness they're so small. Otherwise, they'd be, <laughs> they'd be really dangerous. Um, am I addressing yeah, somebody? Yeah. 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 That's the three year old, and it's sometimes hard to believe that they're going to be reasonable five year olds. It, 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 it is it's difficult to believe it. Yeah. And, and people always talk about the terrible twos, but I think three is, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. And actually, many people are surprised by how sweet they've heard about the terrible twos. And then they're childless, too, and they think this isn't bad at all. But that's, it's just, all right, when we go in front of the speaker. Uh, so anybody else, uh, a question about a younger than five? Um, uh, Sean, you're all right. Please, yes, here. You want to go? Ahead? Thanks. All right. Yeah, I want to. Here, please, please. Tell me your name. Um, yeah, hi. My name is Joan White, and I have a four and a half year old boy. Yes. Totally delightful in every way, um, except I want to help him stay in touch with his anger, but channel it in a way that's not destructive. He is in touch with his anger. Yeah, but I. <laughs> <laughs> right, because he's challenging, exactly. and he gets furious. Totally furious. Right, because because a, bro a broken cracker mostly. <laughs> right, but he he's uh, uh, upset because he he would like to bend the universe to his will and opinion and run everything. Especially ours. Yeah, yeah. Well, your house is just the beginning. <laughs> Uh, 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 it's the local venue for the universe that he would like to run. And his frustration mounts up pretty fast. And then he, he melts down and is furious and hard to comfort. So hard, it's like an hour. <laughs> right. So ask me a question which, for which I may not have the... So how do you let him know the feeling is okay, but what to do with it? That's not destroying it. I don't actually think, I know the modern parent always wants to affirm the feeling. Yeah, he's, he's actually, he's fine with the feeling. <laughs> I, I don't think you have to affirm much. Uh, I, 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 I think you have to say, you know, I, I get it. I take this seriously. So can you, can can. Can you calm down? Do you need me, your mom, to help you calm down? Um, and begin to uh, uh, introduce a little reason, not along the discussion. Uh, do you think you can calm yourself? Do you need me to calm you? I get him to focus on the idea that one of the other of you is going to get him to the calming place. Right? Because the job of a mother of a four and a half year old is to help him learn to um, develop more self-control. And I mean, you can't imagine the, uh, how big his feelings are inside. They're just taking him over. You can see it. But I mean, just they've completely taken him over. And his dreams are big and his fury is big. Um, and your job is just to respect that and to, and to help him. So he'll, he'll have it. He'll have it, but it's important that moms work with him because we know that a mother who works with a, <clears throat> a boy is going to produce a more empathic adult in his 30s, actually. Okay? A long payback. <laughs> <laughs> a long payback, yes, that's right. <laughs> well, it's, uh, this, uh, there's no quick... ROI in parenting, right? <laughs> Return on investment. Yeah, it's a long-term ROI. Um, uh, five to ten. Five, anybody, five to ten-year-old, please, your name. Hi, I'm Tossie. Hi, Tossie. Hi. Um, so I have two boys, 19 months apart. Sorry, two boys, 19 months apart. And um, back in the three-year-old range, and my oldest was three. Um, I was at a good end. Yeah. I did not handle that three-year-old phase as well as I would have liked. Yeah. I, I met him with his ender. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. And 
since then, I have regained some sanity. And, uh, he is now eight. Mm -hmm. um, and he's regained or gained some control of himself yeah. as well. But I see some residual impacts of that time. And I'm just wondering if you have suggestions. What do you think you see? Um, hmm. um, a lot of um, assuming that, a lot of just upfront anger that I don't think is, would have been there had I not fostered that through my interactions. Okay, I can hear the parental guilt. But you think you, you if, if you hadn't gone to the barricades uh, 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 with him at three, that he, he wouldn't have such a ready anger yeah, now. Yeah, it was three and four. It was yeah, four. okay. Well, these are the tough, say, I'm not surprised to hear this, because this is what the battle with uh, a certain kind of little boy is. But there are some peaceful boys who, who don't uh, get into power struggles. And then there's some others for whom it, it, it is a, a ready option, and you had one of those. Um, very hard to know what is temperament and what is parenting. But um, what I want to know is, does his school experience him as angry? No. All right. So it's important that you all uh, appreciate that sometimes there are things that go on between a mother and child that are in the relationship but it doesn't mean the child was badly parented, right? So he's not taking his anger out on the world. He's not blowing up at school. You're not hearing about this. This is special for you. <laughs> right? Um, and that is both a source of pain and, but ought to be a source of some um, satisfaction, that it's, he's not taking this on the road. Okay? Yeah. Um, anybody else? Uh, five to ten, please. And your name? Corby. Yes, Corby. Um, I guess my son has, um, unlike you, uh, my son does um, blow up at school as well. Yeah. And I think a lot of his anger is is um, because he believes that he that nobody listens to it. Right. And it doesn't seem to matter whether people try to listen to him or not. Once he gets to that space, he's making he's making assumptions before right. before the, the incident. Okay. Um, Corby, did you tell me his age? I'm I'm not he's picturing it. Not, he'll be ten in Okay. And he believes that life is not fair. Yes. And it lands unhappily on him. Correct. Okay. Um, he's not the first boy uh, who, who, who has thought this, and whose sense of uh, outrage is connected to a sense of injustice in the world. Um, have you talked to him about a future career in the law? Okay. It's, it, it's useful. Um, uh, uh, but a keen sense of justice and, and feelings of injustice, powerful feelings, is something that I tend to associate um, with uh, a boys, and um, or at least the ones who vocalize it. I'm sure, I'm certain, there are girls who feel the world is not just, but they don't often proclaim it um, as loudly uh, and as furiously as boys do. Um, does he get the attention of the authorities and do they feel disrupted by? They definitely uh, feel disrupted. Yes. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. So you're hearing about that. Yeah. Um, but I don't. Um... Let, me, let me say something about perfectionism in boys. Um, perfectionism, we think of as I need to be perfect. And I'm going to be ferocious on myself unless I'm uh, perfect. And that's the kind of perfectionism that leads to obsessive compulsive behavior. But there's a kind of perfectionism that is 
uh, attached to idealism. The world ought to be perfect. It's not perfect. I see it, what it should be, and it makes me furious that it is not, and that I can't get, I can't, again, bend the universe to my will and opinion. And this fury um, that the world is not fair um, is, is one that has to be taken seriously. But what's unattractive is if a child positions himself to always see himself as a victim of an unjust world. And so one of the things you're going to need to help him see is that he has strategy. He has um, uh, resilience. He can cope. That the fact that the world is not a perfect place um, doesn't need to be a source of outrage for him always because the things he can do to make it a better place. And his growing sense of power and efficacy will reduce his feeling of the, of the unfairness. Because it's unfair now. The world is not perfect, as we all know. But he doesn't have, think he has any tools to deal with it. And when he feels he has more tools to deal with it, and more ways to handle it, um, then he won't be uh, quite as uh, furious about it. So that's what I would work on, is how can he get some sense of personal power in an unjust world? The problem is he's stuck in school. <laughs> and that becomes a source of uh, just built-in fury. As my colleague in Chicago went to the University of Chicago with me for her PhDs, and she works with <clears throat> Head Start programs and has been training Head Start teachers <clears throat> in Chicago for years. And she said, you know, there are just many boys who experience school as being like jail. They're sort of permanently angry. And that is something I will talk about. Um, so 10 to 15, one, one and then we'll, we'll uh, go off, please. Yeah. Hi, thank you for coming. My name is Laura. Yes. I have three boys, 10, 12, and 14. <laughs> <laughs> They're wonderful, wonderful kids. Um, and here is my question. If they are given any two or more minute space of time, yeah. they will go and try and play a video game on a screen. Yeah. They are so drawn to it. Yeah. We have lists of things to do before you can use the screen. We have yeah. lots of opportunities and alternatives in our home. But for some reason, yeah, it's the most compelling they thing there. cannot get themselves to stop right. the screens. So what do you Do you have a daily to? limit? Do you have a screen limit? We do, but honestly, um, uh, both my husband and I work, so they're home for a, alone for a couple of hours after school. Right. And that is the worst because that's, you know, they'll just sit there the entire time. Well, so when you get home, is that the end of screen time for the evening? Absolutely. Yeah, good. So the, the limit is your arrival. <laughs> right now. <laughs> but it, it's hard to have three boys be deeply dismayed that you've arrived at home. <laughs> And they sneak it, and I we know. don't want them to feel like they have to sneak it. We would love to be able to work with them with a healthy amount of screen time per day. And I can't, we cannot figure it out. No, I know. This is a, this is a worldwide, this is a worldwide uh, issue. It's, uh, I was in uh, China last week. It is a worldwide issue. Chinese parents are, have their boys who are addicted to screens, and the Japanese have been, um, uh, writing about this, Japanese psychiatry has been writing about this. Boys who just won't go to school and just hold up in their rooms playing video games. Meanwhile, the neuroscientists are trying to figure out if it is a true addiction on a neurobiological basis, like uh, gambling and sex, which you know affects the dopamine uh, receptors in the brain and, and, and locks you in, or whether it's just psychologically addictive. But it kind of doesn't matter, does it? Uh, no, because whether it's neurobiological or just psychologically addictive, so it's so powerful. So we're faced with, do we, um, do we just change all the passwords and take away the things? That's where we're at, because I Well, you know, I think you have to find a way to limit something. 
And every school I know is fighting this. Um, and uh, I, I work at an old boys school uh, outside Boston Belmont Hill School, and we thought we had rules that were being obeyed, but we got Sherry Turkle, who's written a great deal about um, uh, technology use among kids. She came in and sat in the back of our classes, and she said, your teachers have no idea how much uh, of use is going on uh, illegally. So, you know, you're clueless, but we're all feeling clueless. I, what I don't want you to feel is um, self-conscious or bad about the war you're fighting. I want to announce it for my sons should know that this is a healthy hunt and chase game <laughs> with their parents. It's kind of a meta uh, video game uh, that, that they're playing with their parents. And, and you know that they're addicted, you know they're going to sneak it, and you don't trust them, and you are going to hunt them down. <laughs> their devices when the use is excessive. And I would have a sense of humor about it and, and a seriousness of purpose. That's perfect, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, my life was changed 20 years ago this month. Um, Dan Kinlan, a professor at the Harvard School of Public Health, had asked me whether I wanted to write a book about um, the psychology of boys, because he was doing research on boys, uh, uh, particularly with Tony Earls, uh, uh, on 6,000 um, kids in, in inner city Chicago. And he asked me if I wanted to write about it, but he, would, he and I both started consulting to all boys schools. He did St. Sebastian's Catholic All Boys School, and Dedham and I had started at Belmont Hill. And um, we'd had to adapt all of our uh, therapeutic techniques, moving from co-ed situations to all-boy situations. Um, and our writing about trying to make a therapeutic contact with boys was the central um, uh, uh, thrust of um, uh, Raising Cain, uh, subtitle uh, Protecting the Emotional Life of Boys. It was, the book was published six days before the shootings at Columbine. And which is this 20 years ago this month. The, uh, up till that time, the most horrible and the largest school shooting, and there hadn't been many. And one that really changed our view of boys, but the result of it was with this six day old book, Dan and I were pressed into service as a, experts on boys. And all of a sudden, I, for a period of months, I did uh, three or four radio shows a day. Everybody's saying, how do we identify school shooters? Should we have metal detectors in the door? And stuff? I'm, I wasn't a trained criminologist. I hadn't worked with violent populations of boys, though I had certainly worked with angry boys. And I had certainly uh, consulted schools about a disruptive and, and challenging boy behaviors, but not school shootings. But not many people had at that time. Um, what was interesting to me was when I was on a morning TV show, I'd be asked all these questions about potentially violent boys. But then when the camera was turned off and the lights went off, an anchor would, would turn to me and say, you know, my 15-year-old won't talk to me. How do I get my 15-year-old to talk to me? Or the camera would come out, come behind the camera and say, I have a 17-year-old, I don't know what's going on. I mean, could he be violent? And it seemed that many people thought boys were a mystery. Um, and that gave me a sense of mission, which has propelled me these last 20 years, to talk about what the inner life of boys is and how they construct <clears throat> their world and their sense of masculinity. And that's what I'm here to talk about tonight. Um, viewing things from 35,000 feet, there are four issues which all of us who advocate for boys, and I never meant to be a boy advocate. I, I was a feminist-inspired psychologist 
at the University of Chicago, I wrote my PhD dissertation on anorexia nervosa as a cultural illness. And I believe that our culture tortured girls about their body image and that our, uh, um, as Mary Pfeiffer wrote in Reviving Ophelia, that the culture was toxic for girls. I've been very influenced um, by the feminist revolution, the women's movement. That's what I came out of. But, um, so to find myself an advocate for boys was really a surprise. But the moment you start to consult to schools, um, even schools that haven't had anything violent happen to boys, you, you soon find that two thirds to three quarters of your referrals in elementary school are boys. Um, they're more anxious little boys. They're more angry little boys. There are more boys who are struggling with learning. There are more boys who find the school a tough bit. <clears throat> and then there are teachers who seem to be locked into struggles with boys. And I, I still get um, uh, uh, referring to is, is it Ms. Tessie? Yeah, Ms. Tessie, yeah. Um, I get preschools who say, you know, we have this four-year-old boy who's taking over the pre-kindergarten class. And he's like brought the school to a halt. Uh, and, and I can tell there's just a monumental power struggle going on with a very upset and angry little boy, but now nobody can reach him. And I've had teachers say to me, you know, I try and talk to this boy and ask him why he did what he does, and he doesn't tell me, and he's like a psychopath, and I think, Relax. He's a little boy, and he's cornered, and he's using everything he's got. Um, but we have to understand his psychology. So there are four issues um, from 35,000 feet, which those of us who advocate for boys are thinking about. And, and I'm, let me just mention these, and I'm going to move to the particular worries about boys at every age, which is how I've started this talk. Um, we are the most violent country in the industrialized world. Our murder and rape rates are 2 to 20 to 60 times higher than the countries in Western Europe. And of course, the most violence is committed by young men. And, and so when people look at boys and their play and their interests, in a country like ours, they, they can't stop thinking about could these boys be violent? This is not a question that actually parents in Germany think about. It's not a question that uh, uh, parents in Japan think about because the rates of young male violence there are so fantastically low. Um, but our culture has these high rates. And so the, the issue of violence and could this boy be violent, could his video games, be desensitizing him to violence could, um, you know, could he get out of control is an issue that follows every boy in school. And even if you're a peaceful, highly verbal boy who loves to read, you get painted with that, that brush, at least the concern uh, uh, about boys. Um, and I need to mention it because it's been there and it drives a lot of what um, what, what I get asked to do after the Brett Kavanaugh hearings, lots of all boys private schools called me <laughs> and said, would you come and talk about boys respecting women? And I thought, huh, the Kavanaugh hearings um, is what you want me to address. Uh, somehow, whenever boys have trouble, my phone rings. <laughs> Um, and I'm happy to talk about it, but um, uh, it always has the undertone of, can we fix boys early? Which is a view about boys that I object to more about that in a second. The, the other issue is that um, uh, boys are underperforming in schools relative to girls. When I graduated from high school in 1965, um, I'm 72 this month. Um, 
uh, 58% of college graduates were young men, mainly a group of young, privileged white men like me. And that pendulum, 58% young men and 42% young women, has over the course of my working life swung to the exact same spot on the other side. Our college graduates now much more diverse and interesting group of people are now 58% young women and 42% young men. It's in the exact same spot and we're headed for 60%. And I was, um, I was on board with arguments that said that young women were being systematically discriminated against by college counselors and uh, just regular high school counselors and not propelling them to, to college when those statistics were what they were uh, 50 years ago. But now we have the same statistics with the genders reversed. And the No Child Left Behind Act has shown that boys are behind girls in all 50 states. Um, uh, some research suggests that the average uh, 11th grade boy in the United States writes at the level of the average 8th grade girl. Um, that the gap between genders is almost as big as the historic and shameful gap between white and black and white and Hispanic. Part of what was the No Child Left Behind Act was supposed to reveal was the schools that were failing uh, children of color um, and at-risk minority populations of all kind, but also re revealed these huge gender gaps. I mean, two-thirds of the valedictorians in the United States are girls. I go to any school and I say, well, What's the gender breakdown of your top 25% of your senior class? Well, we don't know. We don't keep gender statistics. I say, is there a college counselor in the room? They say, college counselor says about 70% girls, 30% boys. And I said, what's the gender breakdown of the bottom 25% of your class? Well, it's about 70% boys and about 30% girls. The middle 50, band of 50% is mixed, but the top and the bottom are, are gendered, and boys are underperforming. Girls surpassed boys overall in American public education in 1982. They pulled even in math and science in 2004. There are now more young women taking <coughs> pre-calculus and calculus than boys, and then going on to college and finishing college. And this is an issue. This is an issue. Um, and as I say, I keep referring to my age, but maybe because of my birthday month, but I have been around remembering when teachers said girls were math phobic. Mm -hmm. And we ought to get young, talented women to come in and teach honors math in middle school to give girls, propel girls towards higher math achievement in high school. And I thought, yes! And yet I go to few, too few districts who are working on the enormous lag in boy writing, and boys dislike of writing. And I hear from teachers, boys don't like to write. I don't know why. We're just asking to share their feelings in journals. <laughs> in, in, fifth, in fifth grade, they ought to want to write. I don't know why they, I don't know why they don't want to write. Um, but too few districts are working on it. Uh, I think partly because there are a generation of teachers who feel that to pay special attention to boys is unwittingly to support the patriarchy. <laughs> and it's complicated. It's, it's really complicated. But the most interesting thing that's happened in my working lifetime is the availability of the human brain. When I was in graduate school, um, we only had cadaver brains, and we knew that the male brain was bigger, but the form and structure of the brains uh, I was taught we're identical. But uh, now we have so many ways of looking at the human brain as it's operating. PET scans and MRIs, lots of different ways. And we're seeing, as Steve Pinker said a few years back, he's a professor of psychology at Harvard, we have 60 um, uh, pieces of research showing us that there are meaningful uh, gender differences in the brain. 
one of the Shabrits is at Yale studying dyslexia, and they gave a, um, a, a language rhyming task to boys and girls and to men and women, and then watched them complete the rhyming task while their brains were being, were lit up in the way that they can do with a PT scan. And they found that the boys and girls were using different parts of their respective brains. Whoa, whoa, that's a fundamental challenge to co-education, isn't it? Because the whole idea of co-education is we can teach boys and girls together because the lesson lands on their brains in the same way, yes? Well, does it? How different are the brains of boys and girls? And now I need to give you a little <clears throat> course in the statistics of the gender brain. So bear with me. Um, if you gave all the psychological tests ever developed, if you gave them to girls, it's a theoretical exercise because there are hundreds of thousands of psychological tests um, they've been developed to torture human beings with. <laughs> Psychologists need to do this when they're writing their doctoral dissertations, right? So, um, but let's say you gave all the hundreds of thousands of tests to girls, it would fall out on a bell-shaped curve. You'd have a girl bell-shaped curve, the, right? The standard distribution, we know this, because everything human falls out that way. Then if you gave the same hundreds of thousands of tests to boys, it would fall out on a boy bell-shaped curve. And then the interesting question is, if you superimpose the girl bell-shaped curve on the boy bell-shaped curve, how closely overlapping are they, right? And again, it's a theoretical exercise, but we think we know the answer, that the brains are 85 to 90% overlapping. If you think of the brain as a mosaic made up of tiles, the men and women is from 90% of the tiles in your brain are both brains. And the women have 10% of tiles that I don't have. And the men have 10% of tiles that the women don't have, right? So 90% overlapping. That's why coeducation is valid. But the 10% is interesting. More about that in a second. But then you say, well, so the human brain is more human than it is gendered. And anybody, and there are a number of advocates for boys, so Michael Gurian, a man I like very much, but he gets up and talks about the male brain and the female brain. And that's just scientific rubbish. They're not separate brains. If they were separate brains, then we jolly well ought to, we ought to educate them separately and direct our lessons to the two different brains. But I've been on the dais with many, many neuroscientists to say, look, we just, we're just getting the beginning of knowledge about the differences, but we don't have actually how to teach to them. And in any case, not all girls have the, the difference. Not all boys have the differences, right? Uh, in fact, if you choose, and this is the second level of understanding, if you choose girls, at, uh, at random, this is why it's a little statistics course, choose any two girls at random and compare them on any trait. Those two girls are more likely to be different one from the other than girls are different from boys on that trait. If you choose any two boys at random and compare them, they're more likely to be different from one another, then boys as a group are different from girls. The language for this is within group variance is greater than between group variance. So if you think about it this way, um, a very shy boy and a very shy girl are gonna have a more similar journey through school than a very shy boy and a highly gregarious and social boy. The gap between those two boys is bigger than the gap between the shy girl and the right? So individual temperament rules, right? It beats everything. The, that, that unique thumbprint that is a human being that is like no one other, that, that beats gender differences. So if I'm saying, all right, the brain is more human than it is gendered, individual variation triumphs, why am I in my peer fun? doing my boy shtick, <laughs> right? What, I mean, if it's, 
Well, here's the deal. If you go up to the top of the girl bell-shaped curve and you drop down the average, that dotted line, the average girl, right from the top, and you go up to the boy bell-shaped curve, remember the two bell-shaped curves are 90% overlapping, but you drop down the average girl and the average boy, those two dotted lines are meaningfully and significantly different. Our average girl and our average boy are different and I'm going to say in three dimensions which really affect how they perform in school. Physicality. By school age, by five, three quarters of the boys in the class are more physically active and more impulsive than any girl. Okay, three quarters. They're not 90% overlapping. They're only 25% overlapping. And there's some girls who are as active and restless and maybe as impulsive as the boys. But pound for pound, your average boy is just far more, and who's this news to, right? <laughs> right, this is, I'm telling you, science is perfectly obvious. Every kindergarten teacher is trying to get her kids sitting in a circle for reading time. All the girls are sitting there, and she's got some boys, but then she's got some boys wandering around, and when she tries to corral them, the boys in the circle start to pig pile on one another. And she's got to come back and get them going, right? They're just way more physical and more impulsive. Um, not every boy, but the average boy. Um, girls are more efficient processors of language. By school age, girls just are clicking, you know? They're doing linguistic analysis, and the boys are still over in the right hemisphere thinking, I know this is like Legos. And, and, and it's not, actually. <laughs> It's just not like Lego. <laughs> but girls um, process language more efficiently in both hemispheres. They get to that point faster uh, and more efficiently than boys. And the elementary school classroom is four-fifths language-based. Okay? So a lot of boys think, what is this in school about? It's rigged. As one six-year-old boy said to me, you can't do anything in school. And I said, what do you, what do you mean? He said, well, you can't climb on the tables, you can't wrestle, you can't do anything. <laughs> it, 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 it's your school. And then there is, there is another issue, which is boys engage, and I believe for biological, for fundamental wiring reasons, in a certain kind of set of behaviors, which are described by animal behaviors as dominance behaviors. And your name is? Chris. Chris. So Chris, you and I are in first grade together. And I come up to you and I say, Chris, what you're doing is stupid. And besides, I can run much faster than you. <laughs> and what are you going to say to me, Chris? That's right. I'm going to say, no, you're not. And I'm faster than you. Yes. <laughs> the, but the moment I insulted Chris, he gave me a big smile. <laughs> You couldn't see him, but I could. He gave me a big smile. Oh, like, oh, game on. <laughs> but for schools, what I just did to Chris is considered antisocial and negative and possibly dangerous. Back to my first point about the cloud of potential violence hangs over every boy. So this meeting of two boys that starts with an insult and a challenge. I mean, probably our greatest writer about boys, uh, um, Mark Twain, begins his book, Tom Sawyer, with two 12-year-old boys meeting on the street. They immediately begin to insult each other's fathers, not knowing that neither of them has, essentially, effectively, a father. They start attacking each other's fathers. Then they get into a physical scuffle. And then Twain says, this was, of course, the beginning of a great friendship. <laughs> but many people consider the way boys were laid to be uncooperative and potentially dangerous, and certainly not nice. So let me um, uh, introduce you to a boy, uh, the Melrose Public School System. Uh, how many of you saw my film last week? So that's a repeat for those of you, sorry about that, but we're gonna meet Kevin, who's at the Lincoln School in Melrose, and I'm the narrator, so we can, uh, 
We, we, they'll, they'll speak for themselves here. We good? All right, thank you, Pam. No problem. I'll ask for some stuff hard for you fun to do. You know, it's tough being a boy in school. By ages 10 and 11, girls perform equally well as boys in math and science, and much better in reading and writing. Boys are still less emotionally mature, more physically active, and more impulsive. <laughs> that leads many boys to conclude that school is a place where the deck is stacked against them. But, as we shall see, an understanding teacher can help change that attitude. <laughs> mostly white community outside Boston. At the Lincoln School, Mr. Oteri's fifth grade class has 14 boys and five girls. Nationally, boys account for 70% of the D's and F's given out at school. Why the difference? Well, what's school all about? School's mostly about sitting down and listening to an adult talk. Our formula is one half times the base. For boys like Kevin, that can be very hard to do. Six, six is the base times. <laughs> Kevin and I have challenging days. Base is six, height is five, one half times. He does have a hard time focusing. Now, what's our formula for area of triangle again, Kevin? Um, five and six. What's the formula? How do we figure it out? And when he does get distracted, um, it, it definitely takes away from what, what he has to get done. Hold on. Ooh. Last year, Kevin's distractibility caused his grades to fall. He got mostly C's, and he sometimes disrupted class. Kevin? 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 Kevin may push things to an extreme, but his energetic behavior is typical for boys his age. So it's no surprise what boys say they like most about school. Uh, gym, 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 uh, recess, recess, uh, lunch, snack, gym. 30 years ago, elementary schools offered recess twice a day. Boys got a chance to work off their physical energy. But there's only one recess at Kevin's school to make more time for classes. Some schools are even eliminating recess altogether. I believe that's a real mistake. Boys in particular need more recess, not less, to become more effective students. Yeah, we haven't heard yet? Okay, hold on, I'll get to you, what's your question, Jill? All too often, this behavior gets labeled as a disorder. Now, there's no denying that some boys do have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. In fact, they're nearly three times more likely than girls to have ADHD. But when almost 85% of the world's stimulant medication gets prescribed to American boys, we have to ask the question, are we medicating boys because they're sick or because they're boys? I, 
I have mixed feelings on it. As an educator, I've seen it work wonders with, with kids. You can see with some kids, when they're not on the medication, when they are on the medication. It, it's very clear. Uh, as a parent, I have a different feeling about it. Um, I don't know if I want my son or daughter having to take a pill every day. And then we moved to the South Bronx. Um, an African American boy named Reuben, uh, whose public school teacher tells his adoptive grandmother, get him somewhere else, get him out of public schools. He's cute, he's going to be a player, the girls are all interested in him. Um, but he's really gifted academically, and uh, his grandmother moves him to uh, an old boys Catholic school, uh, George Jackson Academy. And, we, we follow um, his fortunes. So those of you who saw the film uh, uh, saw Reuben. And it's not that I'm making a brief for boys' schools. I am the consultant um, to an old boys' school. But I think um, we all have to be open to whatever approaches are successful for boys. When I show Kevin, when I showed Kevin at uh, the Tennessee Teachers Association in Nashville, uh, 900 public school teachers, and when my narrative voice said, uh, Mr. O'Terry's class has uh, 14 boys and five girls, there was a collective groan. Uh, <laughs> and I actually resent that, uh, working in an all-boys school, the idea that, uh, you know, that a, a class of boys would be a burden. Uh, and that professional teachers would say so. On the other hand, when I've shown this with my colleague Ned Hallowell, who wrote Driven to Distraction and Answers to Distraction, 
and delivered from distraction and married to distraction. <laughs> Ned has the distraction franchise. Uh, <laughs> what wonderful books. But he says, you know, uh, with a little bit of medication, um, Kevin's day in school would be much easier. And uh, Melrose had been trying to get Kevin on medication for two years. Um, but his mother wouldn't have it. And so I was really in debt to Melrose Public Schools and particularly the principal of the Lincoln School that she allowed us to film Kevin um, because he was not an easy thing, as you heard Mr. O'Terry uh, say. Um, but, but I have to tell you, whenever I was filming that PBS documentary, I was with five guys. There was a producer, an associate producer, a first cameraman, a second cameraman, and a sound guy. And so they were top PBS documentary filmmakers. The sound man had just come back from Africa with Oprah, and they, they had amazing resumes. All five of them completely identified with Kevin's school experience. <laughs> Jason, the 32-year-old cameraman, I spent the days with Kevin and Jason. Jason moved more than Kevin. Uh, it was Jason. I wasn't there when Kevin was sent on his walk and Jason chased him down the stairs. But there was a kind of a special irony in it because Jason had found a profession where he could move constantly and he hadn't stopped moving. Um, and, but it was interesting to me that these men had their memories of school were pretty unhappy, and their relief at finally finding a profession where they could move um, a, a, a almost constantly, which is what filmmaking is actually, um, was notable that, that they all uh, uh, identified with him. So the issues for boys in school are very often what you heard the parents uh, uh, talk about. The, the, um, the ferocity of the three-year-old, the fury of the four-and-a-half-year-old, and, a half year old, and uh, calming that, um, that anger. They've got these muscular little bodies now, and they've been playing with the boys' group, and they, they understand now they live in a boys' world where they have to command the respect of other boys. Uh, boys and girls play together without reference to gender at one and two and two and a half. And sometimes in a preschool class, you can find there's a formidable girl who is the real physical enforcer of everything. And the boys are like in awe of her. But at around three, the girls separate from the boys. This is a universal phenomenon. This is seen around the globe. The girls separate from the boys and say the boys play too rough. Because indeed, boys are engaged in rough and tumble play. That is the scientific term for it. It's not aggressive play. It's not violent play. Most often, nobody gets hurt at all. If people get hurt, it's often accidental. When people say, what do we do about the problem of violent play at the playground? I say, are you having people hurt? Well, no, but you know, they play violently themed games. You know, they shoot each other like this. Um, what, what I was in Philadelphia once, and a mother came up to me and said um, that she was a birthright Quaker and that she had never allowed any kinds of guns of any kind into her house. And it, they, it was a proper Quaker family. They preached uh, tolerance and pacifism um, and, and conscientious objection to war in all his ways. But that one day her older son chewed his toast into the shape of a pistol <laughs> and, and, and shot his younger brother at breakfast. <laughs> so I've always referred to it subsequently as the Quaker mother problem. Right? <laughs> what do you do when your Quaker son chooses toast into the shape of a pistol? <laughs> what I said to her was, why did he need to, sh you know, he had this the whole time. <laughs> Many people are um, uneasy with uh, the nature of uh, a boy's play, and there are many elementary teachers whom I think in all good conscience are doing what they think is violence prevention without any scientific support for what they're doing. 
because nobody's ever established a scientific correlation between boys play and later boy violence. Uh, but people swear that their sons are being desensitized to violence by video games. And certainly Craig Anderson at Iowa State has been trying to establish the link. He doesn't like video games. He's been studying worldwide research. He can't. <clears throat> we know that video games shorten your attention span for other things. But TV's been doing that for 70 years. Um, that it is arousing. Um, the, the aggression centers of the brain light up when you're playing a first-person shooter game. Um, but all the moment you turn it off, uh, it, it, it goes off. The brain doesn't, doesn't remain lit up. But mom say to me, oh, my son, is, these video games make him very aggressive. And I say, really? Uh, give me an example. Well, whenever I tell him to stop playing, he gets mad at me. And I said, <laughs> Children have always resented being told to stop playing. Uh, and the addictive power, we heard some testimony about that uh, from a mom here. So the, the issues of boys playing with other boys and constructing a sense of masculinity. Um, uh, by age four, boys are defining boy play is different from girls and better than girls. And a lot of four-year-old boys sound like little chauvinist pigs. Uh, they sound like little misogynists, and people get quite frightened of that. Um, but it's, to me, an, an identity exercise. Uh, it's, it's contrast and compare. What the girls do is stupid. What we do is virtuous and <laughs> exciting. And um, it's for lack of any way to declare um, uh, what exactly it is to be male. But this I know. For most boys and many men, masculinity is something that they believe has to be won through a series of tests. I don't think girls and women think femininity has to be won. I mean, there are some terrible ordeals and trials for girls about their bodies and thinness and selfies. And Peggy Ornstein writes beautifully about uh, the kind of psychological torture uh, on the internet in a book called Girls and Sex, and I commend it to you. But don't, girls don't often believe that they're being tested all the time. But little boys often think that they, there are tests being given and if I fail them, I cannot command the respect of other boys. And if I win them, then I'm on the road to the next test. <laughs> and the next, te the next test and the next test. And it's very hard for us sometimes to interrupt that belief that they have to impress their peers and pass the test in order to win the right to think of themselves as a self-respecting boy. I was once in Toronto, actually the old blind all boys school, and I asked a group of 17, 18 year old seniors, how many of you ever feel, felt your masculinity was on the line? And if you fail to do something, you you were gonna lose credibility. As a boy and a man, you were only lose points in that contest. And, and tell me the story. So these 17 and 18 year olds all um, told me stories about they know very definitely when their peers have, have challenged them and, and they know that their self respect uh, as a boy and a man is, is up for grabs. So this boy told me he'd gone to a summer camp in Canada, and I'm interested, I wrote a book on summer camps called Homesick and Happy, and I'm a big fan of summer camps. I'm not a fan of this particular thing. They had a 30-foot diving tower uh, on, on the lake, and the rule of the camp, why this rule? The rule of the camp is, if you climb the ladder, there is only one way down. <laughs> Right? And I see people putting, because you did that. I was a boy who was scared of heights. I mean, I saw, like, right? Anybody? 
remember the sensation of being on top of a 30 foot diving tower and looking down and thinking, mm -hmm. oh crap. <laughs> but this boy had avoided it all summer. Oh, he had avoided it all summer, but it, it drew him and finally he climbed the ladder and he got up there and was terrified. He was absolutely terrified. He was strict. So all the boys standing down on the dock were doing what? They were taunting him, saying, you got to jump. There's only one way down. That's the rule. You can't, you can't climb back down the ladder. And he stood up there, you know, just potentially ashamed and humiliated and then really at risk. And at that point, a young counselor, um, seeing the dilemma the boy was in, uh, went up the ladder himself, walked up next to him, held out his hand, and said, give me your hand, we're going together. Boom. <laughs> right? And, you know, a lot of boys need somebody who will go to them in that moment. When Dan and I uh, chose the subtitle for Raising Cain of Protecting the Emotional Life of Boys, uh, sometimes you really have to understand the psychology of boys. Could that young counselor have gone up and stood next to that boy and scolded all the other boys and allowed him to come down the ladder? Maybe, maybe, but by that time the stakes were pretty high. Yeah. And so he stuck out his hand and said, we're going together. And they went together and the boy passed the test. Uh, but when he started describing, this Canadian boy started describing this to me, I teared up um, for the generosity of spirit of the counselor, the depth of his understanding, right? And uh, the elegance of his solution to the boy's uh, problem. And I'm always trying to find an elegant solution to a boy's problem. And, and sometimes, you know, they, they just are baffling. And sometimes they're just kind of mysterious creatures. I, at my boys' school, we, we admit kids, and then they come back for a revisit day. They may have been admitted to other schools in the Boston area, and they revisit us. And, and on a revisit day with a lot of outside visitors, one of our eighth grade boys was possessed by the impulse to hump a radiator um, in a sexually provocative way. And he, the head of our middle school, this woman came to me and said, you have to talk to him and ask him what was going on. And I thought, I don't think he's going to have an answer. <laughs> something in a disciplinary way because the other boys would have been thinking that we were not a respectable school if we hadn't. Um, but there's, uh, I'm always telling teachers, just assume guilt and move on. <laughs> Asked me, what can I do with my nine-year-old? So he's still open to me at 50. <laughs> and I say, nothing. <laughs> Why not? Isn't, can't I do the extraordinarily good mothering at nine? And, no, because he's going to be 15. And my, my chapter on 14 and 15-year-old boys in my book, It's a Boy, it's called Mystery Boys, right? And, and I quote a father, a friend of mine, who said, of course, I don't know what he's thinking. He's 14. And I had a mother at American School in London who said, she said, Dr. Thompson, my 17-year-old, she started to cry. She said, will he ever talk to me again? And I said, when did he stop? And she said, around 14. 
And I said, so he hasn't talked to you really in three years? And she, then she was crying hard. And I had an answer for her, but I asked her, I asked the audience, are there mothers of 20 and 21 girl? And did he stop talking to you and did he not? Did he return at some point? Yes, at 19, after his first serious girlfriend, after he got into college, after he made a varsity sport, after in his mind he had passed the test that won him his manhood, then his mother couldn't unravel him. Because you see, moms, you talk to them, you raised them, they wept in your lap, they, you know, and when they hear your voice, they're 15, and you say, how are you, son? They think, oh my God, one sentence, and I'm feeling 13. And then you ask, really, no, I, please tell me what's going on. And now I'm feeling 12. something to push my mother away and this is really tough on moms because you you love them so and you lay the foundation of their emotional life but that's the problem the regressive pull of the mother and then many mothers think well, well I can't he's not talking to me but I'll turn him over to my husband and the husband and the son may not actually have that kind of conversational flow and uh, a father's of early adolescent boys think a conversation starts with a question like this. How are things going in math, son? Uh, which is a conversation killer. A uh, uh, boys at Belmont Hill say their fathers come to them and say, son, if you want to get into a good college, don't you think you ought to be doing more homework? I mean, that's not a conversation. It's a, it's a mini lecture. But those kind of benchmarking measure up to your father uh, your pa father's uh, viewpoint uh, is infuriating and makes boys close down. And um, so these are the challenges. I, we started with little boys at three. I'm at 15, 16, 17. Um, and I need to uh, I'll throw it open for a few more questions. I hope what I've given you has allowed you to chew on something that will help you to understand your son a bit better questions. We have a good um, can, I, can I take 10, you think? All right, thanks. Uh, you want to get it? Thank you. Thank you. Please. Hi. I don't know if it's working. OK, it is. So um, I'm one of the teachers here at school. Yes. I'm not a man. Yes. Um, and what I took away from your film was the importance of having boys' lives. There are not a lot of men on staff. I know. I go to elementary schools where the only man in the building is a custodian. And the boys admire him because he's got a screwdriver and some keys. <laughs> he's got something useful. <laughs> so I was hoping that perhaps you might have one of those elegant solutions you were talking about. Yeah. Uh, uh, tell me your name. Marina. Uh, Marina. I, I, look, Mothers and women teachers are doing the work of raising children in this world, and, and my hat's off to them. And I work with many, many elementary teachers, and of course the vast majority of them are women. I don't believe we're suddenly gonna get a huge influx of men into, into elementary school. Really, it's more important to me that teachers know how to work with boys and like boys. And this I know that a group of second grade boys can figure out in about three days whether they've got a teacher who likes boys, even warts and all, or she's going to find boys a problem. And if they think they have a teacher who's going to find boys a problem, they organize to torment her. <laughs> and become, and the prophecy is fulfilled. And, and that's the difficulty. That Michael Reichardt and Rick Hulling wrote a wonderful book about boys as relational learners. It's a thin book. It's called I Can Learn From You. And they interview hundreds of boys about why they work for the teachers they work for. And it, it, they kind of suggest that boys have a, a test for teachers. And I remember that. I remember failing some teachers and 
passing some teachers when I was a boy. This is somebody I work for because she gets boys. Or this is somebody I'm not going to work for because she kind of disapproves of us. And I remember hating teachers. I went to an old boys school and I had a majority male faculty. So male teachers in and of themselves are not the answer to me. I had some lousy men teachers. But people who did not like boys and made that clear uh, produced a reaction in me that I just couldn't get around to, to learn. So it's important that boys love their mothers. They love their women teachers as long as they know that the women teachers will temper their uh, discipline with some mercy, have a bit of a sense of humor about boys, a little, a little bit, you know, they'll roll with it. And, and especially, Reinhardt and Holly say, teachers who know something about a boy's life outside of school. Mm -hmm. um, if boys think their teacher is only interested in them as a student in this classroom, that teachers of less interest to them. So I recommend a book called I Can Learn From You by Reichardt and Holly. Please. Uh, thank you for being here. And I want to preface my question by apologizing that I haven't read your book yet. But it's not a test. <laughs> and there's plenty of time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm listening to everything you're telling us about how much, I teach fourth grade. Yes. And I, I'm listening to what you're telling us about how much boys need to move and how physical, and I see that on the playground. It doesn't matter how many times I politely remind boys to have hands off. Or, yeah, yeah. But it is, like, it's just a need that I see that they have, and I'm wondering if you have advice for schools about what are the most, either best practices or most important things that schools can do either at recess or in their school days to support the needs of maybe all students who need that kind of movement and physical. Right. Well, I look forward to the day when I the majority of seats in an elementary school are yoga balls um, and or those uh, kind of rock chair, chairs that move. Uh, the idea that sitting still, a solo sitting still at a desk position is the best learning position has always struck me as bizarre. And it's intolerable for some kids. For some girls, too, you know? We, uh, human beings learn while they're moving. Uh, they often settle themselves with movement. And another book by Reichardt and Holly called Reaching Boys, Teaching Boys, emphasizes that, emphasizes that um, uh, the most important things in capturing the spirit the learning spirit of boys in school is movement, teamwork, competition, and a public product. And uh, you can't make every lesson into a public exhibition or a game. But to people who worship the, the sitting stillness of learning are, are a danger to boys. And the teacher can tolerate uh, some movement, a little noise, and as long as that she knows that there's learning going on, it's going to be just a profound relief to those physically active boys. Um, hi, I am a mom of an 11-year-old boy. He's almost 12, and I'm a single mom. So yes. there's, there's no dad that I can Say, go yeah, yeah. Again. And so when you were talking about this sort of shutting down from 14 to 17, like that is that's completely freaking out. So I, you know, I I, I know that that is not 100 percent going to happen. That's right. But I'm really scared now. <laughs> and so what, um, so what can I do before he's 14 to kind of prepare him? No. For <laughs> no. <laughs> Yes, but, but it, uh, tell me your name. Marty. Marty, you're going to be able to tell whether your son is a happy guy. Um, he, you're going to be able to tell whether he goes off to school with some energy and some enthusiasm. And you'll know from his grades whether he's engaged. You'll know whether he's playing on a team and, uh, and, and whether he's able to make a commitment to something. And you'll know by looking at him 
and his posture and how he reacts with his friends. And you'll know because he will be telling other people that things are fine. And it will break your heart that he's not giving you the readout that you would like because you're his mother and you want to check on whether he's okay. And all he's going to say to you some days, it's fine, mom, it's fine. <laughs> and that is, I get it. That's really hard. Particularly when you're a single mom and you want to know. But Marty, I, I had I had a gift from the gods once. I was at uh, Concord Carlisle High School um, giving an evening talk on my book, The Pressured Child, and a mother brought a nine-year-old boy. Um, and my talk is not for kids. I, whenever I see a kid in my talk and I can get to them, first I say, do you have a device? Please play. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I miss you here. He doesn't have a device. Um, uh, I, I talked with this boy and his name was Teddy. And I said, Teddy, can I call on you at some point if some the adults need to hear something? And I, we were talking about why kids don't ask to answer the question, how was school today? And I asked him, uh, does your mother ask you every day? And he said, yes. He was there sitting next to his mom. And I said, what are you saying? He said, fine, or okay. And his mom's face fell, looked sad. I said, Teddy, do you see that makes your mom sad? He looked at his mom, and he looked sad. He saw her face was sad. And I said, do you see that? And he said, yes. I said, well, why don't you tell him more? Why don't you tell him more about your day? And he stared at me in the way that kids do sometimes. Can you take it? <laughs> the absolute truth. I said, please. <laughs> Teddy, we all want to know. Why don't you tell your, more, your mother more about your school day? And he said, there's not that much she can do about it. <laughs> That, Marty, is in the end, the 14-year-old knows he has to go off and do 8th grade. 15-year-old knows he has to go off and do 10th grade, and there's not that much you can do about it. So giving you the full printout is like they know it's important to you. Now, as a mother, you do, you can play the um, I'm going crazy card. You can say, I'm going out of my mind, I need to know more about your life. Will usually then give you a few more sentences <laughs> to keep you out of the asylum. Uh, you can ask concrete questions. Best thing today, worst thing today. Thing that pissed you off the most. That's going from negativity. I answer this question for mothers of 15 year olds. It's my last answer in my book, Speaking of Boys, which it answers to the most asked questions about raising stuff. It's among the most asked questions I get. How do I get my 15-year-old to talk to me? And I give, I think, some very, very helpful suggestions to double your son's output of words from 8 to 16. <laughs> <laughs> but I wouldn't fear this. If, if he's living a healthy life, you'll be able to see it in his shoulders and his posture, right? And the way he talks to his grandparents, the way he talks to the neighbor, right? But not always to you because there's that regressive pull of the mom that he has to resist. Mm -hmm. Couple more? Are we, are we all, we're, just because our microphone's over here, we, uh, we're not favoring this. <laughs> Ryan, why don't you get one more over here and I'll get one over here just for the sake of balance, okay? <laughs> Have you got anybody over there? <clears throat> yeah, and there was a hand here. I'm, I'm going here, please. Your name? Thank you, Sophie. Yes. Um, just building on that question, I have a 10 year old. Yes. And um, I see him taking happy and everything else, but things that happen that are negative in his life, I don't hear about, but yes. I hear it thankfully because he has good friends. Yes. And those good friends are friends of ours. Yes. How do I get him to talk when things happen at 10? So that when he's 14, he talks to us. Yeah, no, I'm being asked the same question. How can I do something with a 10 year old to ensure they'll have it be open? Yeah, when, <laughs> when you have information about his 10 year old life he hasn't told you, you have to say, okay, I've learned something. Okay. And you go to him and say, I've learned something. 
uh, you clearly didn't want to tell me, but now I'm worked up and you gotta talk me through this. Okay? Yeah. It's just put your cards on the table and tell them what you need to know. And what you need to know is that he's not overwhelmed, he's not flat on the floor, feeling ashamed and victimized and bullied, right. that he has a strategy, and one of the best questions is, how, so how are you handling this? How are you gonna handle it? I mean, tell me how, because if you haven't been running to me, it implies to me that you have a strategy. Okay. And if, I, if you have a strategy, I'll feel much better, right? Tell me your strategy, okay? Please. So on that, just thinking about shame, can you talk a little bit? Because there's so much shaming that happens um, sometimes boys to other boys yes. and then adults to boys. Yes. I'm just curious what you can say about Well, that. Bill Pollock in his Real Boys, Bill's a psychoanalyst at McLean Hospital, and he wrote in his book, in his competitor book, so I have nothing good to say about it, but um, <laughs> uh, he said that he thought a lot of male behavior was shame avoidance, uh, uh, that, you know, when, when that little boy face becomes dark and sullen, it's often fury hiding shame. And um, Bill said in his book that uh, uh, boys he thought were exquisitely shame sensitive. I thought about that a lot. I actually read Bill's book and took it seriously, and I thought, Actually, I think human beings are exquisitely shame sensitive. I think that we are, animals are easily ashamed. Mm -hmm. And with the eyes downcast and looking at the feet is a, you know, it's a human childhood position. Am I adequate? Can I handle this? Have I done wrong? Guilt and shame. <clears throat> um, but, to the extent I agree with Bill, it's about the vulnerability of I'm not cutting it as a future boy. A boy can command the respect of other boys. And uh, that's a particular kind of shame that I won't be seen as a potentially strong man and boy because I have feelings of fear and anxiety. And I know these very well because I was a very anxious boy. That's why I'm a psychologist, you know? That's why, you know, um, uh, you don't become a psychologist because you're uh, not tuned into that stuff. You're usually tuned into it with other people and in yourself as well. And so there's a lot, and especially if you're a very nerdy, intellectual boy, uh, all of which I was, you, you're, you're, you feel at risk in a certain way. But um, part of the boy journey is learning to both defend yourself and react to something with either disinterest, i.e. ignoring it, or humor, uh, which was my gig, uh, or talking it to death, uh, which is also my gig. There, every boy has to learn to handle the kind of testing of other boys in a way that makes him feel self-respecting. And for the athletically lousy uh, boy who feels he's not gonna cut it with uh, the rugged boys, the great relief is to make a friendship and find out there's another boy who thinks about the problem the way you do, right? And the two of you then retire to a corner and talk about how stupid the jocks are, right? And you have contempt and disdain for them. Um, uh, that, that kind of thing, you can also go into martial arts, I just want to say. <laughs> but um, you don't have to always play the team sports, but you can master. You, uh, you, there are many arenas in which you can find yourself. Uh, find you have capabilities. And it's painful for a parent who can't see the road or offer it. Um, but you have to trust that a boy is himself going to find a pathway. 
And if you can trust that he will, that will, he'll feel his confidence is supported. I believe that. There are kids who then need therapeutic support, but that's another talk, huh? Talking about mainstream uh, boys here. Um, okay, I think this is going to be it. This is going to be the last one. Okay? So make it good. I don't no pressure. <laughs> Tell me your name. Minnie Sands. Yes. I have an almost, or I'm the mother of an almost five year old and an almost seven year old. Almost, yes. Almost five year old boy and almost seven year old girl. Yes. So what do you do when that little guy has a lot of energy and it turns into hitting? Not out of anger, but out of, I don't know what, and mostly towards his sister. Yeah. But has she punched him back? That I wish. <laughs> well, why, oh, no, why, why hasn't she? Because we're taught not to hit. Yeah, but he's really annoying. <laughs> I'm tempted to tell her to just hit him, but you know, I don't know if that's really okay. <laughs> um, what's wrong? I have said it, but not totally correct. Yeah, but with no conviction. <laughs> um, but even if she doesn't want to hit him, she can put him on the floor and look him in the eye and say, stop it. It's annoying. He loves her, he wants her to be interested in him, and he wants to annoy her. So he can feel his power. So he's got a whole complex of things going. And my guess is that most of the time between them is pretty good. If you had a stopwatch of these, it would be, and you timed the amount of sort of neutral or positive time to these kinds of little collisions, would it be six to one? Positive? Not all the time. Yeah, it's only occasional. But that stuff really sticks in the in the parental mind. But you have to put it in the in the balance. But you you can say to her, look, I can't protect you against your five-year-old brother. You have to develop some strategies. And as long as you don't hurt him seriously. <laughs> strategies I approve of. <laughs> okay? Um, but they're siblings, and they're, they're going to be, I mean, they've got a, they've got a, a, a deep, complex, loving relationship, and she doesn't have to be completely immobilized by a five-year-old annoying her. I, it's, it, 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 it's a little stressful if you want to be reasonable with him as she might want to be. But is she coming to you for help and support a little? Sometimes, but I tell her to handle it. And you tell her to handle it? Good. Good. I, no, she, they need to work it out. And he needs to know that he, he, there are limits to uh, what she can bear. They, they, we, that's a useful lesson for him. And this is why you have brothers and sisters you know, to teach you useful lessons that nobody else um, can teach you. Hey, look, um, again, I'm just uh, delighted um, that I accepted Jenny's invitation that you all turned out in such numbers, and I thank you very much. Yeah.